In August 1872, a small crew of men boarded a train to Red Bluff, a small town in the state of California. From there, they boarded a stagecoach, headed north, and traveled for 50 miles until they reached the River Pit, where they crossed using the local ferry service, little more than a platform fashioned out of wood and connected to a cable overhead. Once over the river, they set out on foot along a single track path that had been trodden on for millennia by a Native American tribe called the Winnemem Wintu. The territory surrounding the McLeod River was almost untouched, in total contrast to many of California's other watersheds, which had succumbed to the activities of the white man, logging and mining, destroying and laying bare the hillsides. The Wintu had proven particularly adept at driving away and even killing outsiders, so much so that their land remained comparatively uncorrupted by Western progress. Eventually, the crew of men came to the mouth of the McLeod River from where they began to head upstream, along which they eventually happened upon a Wintu settlement. Hanging from the bushes were hundreds of fresh salmon which had been set out to dry. For these weren't just any men traveling through. These were agents of the recently created United States Fish Commission, and it was salmon that they desired. To understand why these men made the perilous journey to the McLeod River, we have to travel back in time and return to the east. Vermont in this case, where George Perkins Marsh, a seminal figure of American conservation, wrote in a report which was submitted to the Vermont legislature that the valiant display by British troops in the Crimean War was part due to the officer's training which included hunting and fishing. Three years before the start of the American Civil War, Marsh stated that, The people of New England are suffering both physically and morally from a too close and absorbing attention to pecuniary interests and occupations of mere routine. In the report, he went on to write, We have notoriously less physical hardihood and endurance than the generation which preceded our own. And that we have become not merely more thoughtful and earnest, but it is to be feared a duller as well as a more effeminate and less bold and spirited nation. Marsh recommended that field sports Fishing, in particular, would help foster the virtues necessary for martial heroism. Unfortunately, human settlement, industry, and commerce had seen waterways in the east dammed, polluted, and made warmer from the disappearance of tree cover due to logging. Marsh didn't believe in the regulation of industry or the regulating of a citizen's right to hunt and fish. For him, the same industries that caused environmental degradation could ultimately provide the solution to declining fish populations. Fish culture. For it is for that very reason that the crew of men, fish culturalists indeed, came to be on the McLeod River in Northern California in 1872. Two years prior, in 1870, a 47-year-old assistant secretary of the Smithsonian called Spencer Fullerton Baird became the head of the newly created U.S. Fish Commission. Two years later, the commission met with Boston state representatives and the American Fish Culturists Association and established that one of their aims was to mitigate the decline of the Atlantic salmon in the eastern states. Of concern was where to source the eggs. U.S. relations with Canada were strained and obtaining eggs from Maine or even Germany were ruled out due to supply limitations. Eventually it was decided to get eggs from Pacific salmon species. That they were altogether different species wasn't a point of concern. During this era, numerous acclimatization societies were established, their aim being to introduce new species to the U.S. or move native species beyond their natural ranges. Some were driven by nostalgia and wanted to introduce species from the old world, whilst others deemed local fauna to have little commercial or recreational purposes, and therefore sought to establish species which they held as more valuable. One of those in attendance at the meeting was a 35-year-old New Hampshire native called Livingston Stone, a founding member of the American Fish Culturists Association. Stone was also one of the crew of men eyeing the drying salmon on the banks of the McLeod River in 1872. 
Here, their objective was to set up a hatchery to collect salmon over, to ship back east to establish Pacific salmon runs. The crew's early contacts with the wind too were fraught with tension. However, Stone, unlike most other white settlers, possessed a healthy respect for indigenous peoples. His outlook no doubt helped to facilitate a degree of cooperation between the two groups, so much so that many Winnemem Wintu were later employed at the hatchery, their superior knowledge of the salmon proving invaluable to Stone's operation. The 1872 expedition, in hindsight, was notable not for the small harvest of salmon ova that was sent eastward, but because it was the first time that Stone had encountered another fish species. The Wintu called them Siula. Stone variously referred to them as Sacramento River Trout, Common Mountain Trout, Red Bounded Trout, and simply Trout. We now refer to this fish as the Rainbow Trout. Stone, however, wasn't the first to rear Rainbow Trout for introduction outside their natural range. It was the Ornithological and Piscatorial Acclimatizing Society of California, formed in 1870, who are credited as being the first. To begin the importation of Rainbow Trout eastwards, this society turned to a man named Seth Green, a commercial fisherman and merchant who himself had begun artificially spawning brook trout sometime around 1864, and by the end of that decade owning the largest hatchery in the United States. It is not entirely clear when or why the society started culturing rainbow trout. Even though they were fairly widespread in the areas where the Californian hatcheries were established, they were almost an afterthought as it took until 1875 for the species to be first shipped outside its native range. 500 eggs were transported east that year, and three years later, Green had raised 275 fish from those eggs, the average size of which was significantly bigger than any brook trout of the same age in their facility. Green enthusiastically noted in a report to the New York Fish Commission that, we believe we shall have conferred the greatest possible boon upon anglers, not only of New York, but of all the Atlantic states, by the acclimatization of these fish. They further commented that while they are not as beautiful as the native brook trout, their hardiness, for certainty in hatching and in raising, they are far superior, and that they take a fly as readily as eastern brook trout and make a better fight against capture. The fact that rainbows could withstand higher temperatures than brook trout meant that they were now better adapted to eastern streams, made warmer due to the excessive logging that had turned once cool waterways into sun-drenched wastelands. Seth Green's trout most likely originated from the San Pedro Brook and the San Andreas Reservoirs, both located around 15 miles south of San Francisco. So enthused were these New Yorkers with these fish that in 1878 they decided to experiment with another strain of rainbows, starting with 113 fry from the river Stone made infamous, the McLeod River. The report further went on to state that we shall give to the private trout breeder and sporting angler exactly the fish he wants. In 1879, Stone had established another hatchery on a tributary of the McLeod called Crooks Creek. This time it was for the purpose of supplying rainbow trout eggs. Because although Stone had sent more than 45 million eggs to 29 states, no new runs of these Pacific salmon ever established in the east. In fact, the only location where runs of McLeod River Chinook salmon ever did successfully take was on the other side of the Pacific, New Zealand's Rakai River to be exact. Conversely, the rainbows were proving less problematic, being tolerant of a degree of pollution and higher water temperatures. For men of influence, this meant that stocking could take place in a larger number of national districts and government wouldn't have to enact strict regulations on industry to protect the environment from the progress of industry. Stone's efforts were so significant that within six years of building his Crooks Creek hatchery, his fish had been sent to 33 of the then 38 states. The Fish Commission also sent eggs across the world, including to Germany, France, Switzerland, and England. Stone himself died in 1912, forced to rely financially on his son. His fish breeding stations are also long gone, and the once abundant salmon runs of the McLeod River are now a distant memory, almost having disappeared. The wind too fared less well. Prior to conflict with the white settlers, they numbered some 14,000, but by 1910, this had caused their population to decline to 400. Today, they number less than 200. 
However, the genes of Stone's brood stock are still with us to this day due to the manner in which these stocks are shared and interbred between hatcheries. Therefore, if you catch a rainbow trout today, part of its DNA can be traced back to the fish that Stone and his crew obtained from the McLeod River over a century and a half ago. I got in trouble, had to roam, my left, my gas. 